All right, welcome back to Doc's House Calls. Today we are joined by Sergio Dorenzo of Dorenzo Watch Company, who uh, just recently wrapped up a fantastic Kickstarter project. It's been delivered now, and I see everybody online posting their pics of, their, of these watches, and everybody seems very happy with them. So um, I wanted to get Sergio on the show and find out more about his unique design sense and uh, his uh, inspirations and what, uh, what he's got coming uh, in the future. So thanks for joining us, Sergio. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And I'm super glad to be here. Uh, thank you for, for giving me the, the opportunity well, to speak. And, and it's so nice to, to talk with you after uh, almost, I don't know, maybe we start, you know, like messaging like uh, a year, a, a year and a half ago uh, when I was seeking some advices with my, with my watch and you were super kind. So. So it's nice to, to finally meet you. Okay, so it is nice to meet you too. We have traded messages for a while. I didn't think it was a year. It feels like it hasn't been that long. But um, we've, we've ne this is the first time we've ever spoken live. We've only traded messages uh, on Facebook. Um, so I was just looking at your uh, Facebook profile. So you are from Argentina, but you live in Switzerland. But you have sort of an Italian name, and I think I've seen you speaking Italian with some guys online. So, are you originally from Italy, and then you moved to Argentina, or are you Italian and but raised in Argentina? It's a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> Do we have time to, to make a, a, a short version of the story? I'm going to make you a, a short version of the story. I'm, I was born in Argentina with uh, Italian uh, family or, or origins. Uh, I grew up in, in Venezuela, in Central America. I studied uh, architecture in Argentina, and then I, uh, in 2000, I, I, I left Argentina and went to Spain, to Barcelona, uh, where I did all my um, professional architectural um, career in, in Spain. And then five years ago, I moved here to, to, to Switzerland, to Geneva. So a bit more complicated, and, but, but yeah, everything is true. <laughs> So you mentioned architecture. So did you move to Switzerland because you got an architectural job there, or did you move to Switzerland because you wanted to be in watchmaking? No, no, no. I, I moved here because a uh, a job in architecture. Uh, in fact, I'm still working uh, part time with uh, with architecture. Uh, and um, since I had to study French uh, in order to work here, I, I began doing a, a French course. Uh, but um, uh, in the in the classroom near the, the, the course, they were given a, a design watch uh, course. So I jumped from one to another, and, and that's why I started with uh, with, with uh, watches. So of course, I always love watches. But, uh, but so I, I, I wasn't working uh, as a designer, as a watch designer before. You were, or you were not. I, I wasn't. I right. Wasn't. So just you speak Spanish. Italian, and now you're learning French. Do you speak any other languages too? I speak uh, Portuguese as well because my, my, my wife, she's Brazilian, so, um, so I'm... <laughs> All right, well, she, I'm, she's uh, probably gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> she's. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you, my friend. All right, so now you live in Switzerland. How long have you lived in Switzerland now? Five years. Five years? Yeah. So... I looked at your website. Obviously, there is, like many designers, there's influence from the past. Many of us in the business are, you know, making vintage inspired fill in the blank. Many of us are doing vintage inspired diving watches, and a lot of the, the inspiration comes from 60s and 70s, that sort of time frame. Uh, other guys are doing sort of, you know, like Kyle from Strat is doing uh, 70s era racing themed chronograph so we all kind of have our niche yours is a little bit different um it looks like you're more inspired by uh mid 20th century and even a little bit earlier race cars and aviation sort of you know the golden age of uh racing and aviation so 30s 40s and 50s do i have that right yeah i think so i think um i'm, I'm more more a bit uh, a guy from the 40s uh, I, I feel it's a, it's a period a bit, a bit more uh, with more, you know, sexy lines or, uh, I, don't, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit old school, but uh, yeah, the 70s or 80s is, is, is something that I, 
I'm not I'm not feeling so so attached. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I I don't think I'm using like uh, or extracting references directly from a from a period of time. I'm trying to to make this mix of old um, style and uh, trying to to do something contemporary. No idea. But so um, I, I, I basically based that off your website and also your first Kickstarter project. You said it was based on the uh, Maserati 250F or Type 250F. And I guess that was from that time period. And that's, you know, o open canopy racing, you know, a very sort of romantic era. And I guess you would probably know better than I would being an architecture uh, student. I guess that's sort of post modernist sort of post Bauhaus that era is that is that right yeah I think uh, it, it's right I really love that era and um, um, I, I was thinking well you were talking that there is a like a little touch of baroque thing you know like a, a bit um, uh, a bit of a decalage uh, something that is is, is not uh, ultra rational, no. Um, so, so I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in those elements. Um, so when you, you say it's not ultra rational, my mind immediately goes to what I think many designers do naturally, which is we make the form follow the function, and we tend to minimalize anything that is unnecessary in the design and instead just look at what's there because it has to be there and try to make that as beautiful as it can be. Whereas I guess I'm not as familiar with the Baroque style, but I, my understanding from what you're saying is there's a, a freer ability to express oneself with little flourishes of design that aren't there because they have to be there, but, but just because the designer feels like that's my little added, you know, uh, touch to the design. Is that right? Exactly. That, that's it. The, the thing is that the, the, my first watch and my second watch, I think they are quite different. Oh yeah, the approach, we're gonna get to your second watch. Yeah, so, so the first one is, is more minimalistic, it's, it's more rational. Um, uh, maybe when I was talking about Baroque, I was talking more about the second wa uh, one, where uh, in fact there, there are some elements that, um, that uh, doesn't follow function, as, as you say. Uh, but uh, yes, um, I think I'm talking more about how I'm trying to 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 uh, um, trying to find a path, no, or, or, to, or to find an identity, um, and maybe it's, it's not exactly uh, how I did it on my on my first watch. I see that, but so to to explain to the audience. You've given me a preview of your next design. So between the second and the third design, I can recognize sort of a continuation of your path as a designer and defining your own style that isn't reckless or random, I guess is a better word, but also isn't necessarily reflected in that first model. And that first model was more very recognizable, with more traditional forms, familiar in that way. It was obviously um, a little bit of its, of an era. It had sort of that more bauhaus -y kind of feel, modernist, racing inspired. It was kind of, I, felt, I, I felt like I saw that, but at the same time, I felt like it was familiar to me because there were other designs being made around the same time that were similar in that way. Whereas your next design, the DRZ02, is a complete departure, not just from the first design, but really from, I think, anything we've seen before. So I wanna talk about that, but before we go there, I think this is something I do on almost every one of these calls, is I think people like to know the backstory of the designer and the, and the owner of the brand. So obviously we know a little bit about, you know, growing up in South America and then moving to Europe and you studied as an architect and you've been an architect, how did you, get into watches were you always into watches as an architect or as a was it an expression of your style as a, an architect that you were always 
you know, also a bit uh, flavorful in your dress and accessorizing. And then you took that and decided, I'm going to design a different product from this physical structure. Or yeah. was it just sort of kind of an accident like it was with me? Can you tell us how, about how you went from being a full-time architect to an architect plus watch designer? Well, always love the design objects. Uh, I've always been super passionate about it. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of, of cameras, photography. Uh, I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, I'm a super fan of Leica cameras. So I'm, I'm, I'm always had the, 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 the uh, I always like objects, you no know, cars, planes, um, uh, especially vintage ones. So um, I think it was in uh, in 2000 when I did that. When I did that trip in Europe, and I, I bought my first mechanical watch. I didn't have a clue. I just bought it because it was old and nice. And and then little by little, I started um, uh, buying and some some watches. But you know, I really had no idea or, or uh, compared to to today that. You know, there's so much information, and and you you, you participate in forums, and you see everything. Uh, back in 2000, you know, I don't know, I, uh, and uh, so so that began that way. Uh, I always had a, 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 a very. Uh, I was fond about watches, and and, uh, and especially uh, old ones. You no, know? uh, never felt so much. Uh, passionate about uh, having a, a swatch or, a, or a, um, something digital um, and I was using as well these old cameras so I, I think everything was interrelated. I think you're gonna win some fans talking about the old cameras because I've seen that where a lot of watch guys are also very into photography a lot of them are into vintage cameras the old Leicas I know Chip from Avig who I literally just spoke to yesterday um, he's very into photography and loves old stuff and old cameras. And I think, um, you know, I, I know a lot of guys, you know, obviously Instagram is huge for watch guys. And a lot of those guys are very good photographers. Um, so, and I, and I know there are other guys in this business who are like us brand owners who are designers of other products. There are other, there, I know there's at least one other guy who's an architect. So there must be something in our nature to you know sort of see in other objects the designer's hand and appreciate that and it also seems like a lot of us sort of uh, long for a, a style that came before or a level of quality that came before that just doesn't happen as often or exist as, as frequently as it, you know today in today's world where everything is more disposable sleek um, kind of dumbed down to the, the lowest common denominator, that mass market, you know, sort of entry level customer where, you know, I mean, again, I mean, watches as a business, it caters to more of an enthusiast market, especially micro brands. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, that's for sure. I, I think when, or for me, when, when you see a beautiful object like a camera or, or a, I feel exactly the same with a, with a a beautiful camera or, or watch is something that that uh, makes you produces you excitement and and um, so so on my Instagram you, you you see many of my cameras I I, I use them in fact for, for photography I, of course I'm, I'm using digital and, and analog but um, you know um, uh, for example uh, with Leica cameras no I I uh, I always use them as a reference of how I would love to my, my brand to, to become something that uh, engage uh, or, or that people feel so passionate about. Uh, that, so that's that's a bit. Uh, there's only there's as well the, the relation of the object, but as well the relation with the brand. No, for me it's not the same. Uh, I don't know um, Olympus or another brands. They they don't. Uh, spark this passion. So, so I'm, I'm using some some of my, my own cameras to, to try to to uh, to learn about how to to produce something uh, that produces excitement. You know, um, 
Do you, do you ever feel like, as a designer, even if it's some, not, you know, forget about the building you designed or the watch you designed, when you look at something like a camera and you really appreciate the features and the, and the structure and the form and the elegance of the design, but then someone who isn't into f photography or vintage cameras sees it and doesn't understand, doesn't see, do you ever feel like a sense of frustration that the artist or the designer of the object deserves more credit and the world just doesn't get it? And, and I, I feel that frustration, on, like not for myself, but for others when I see something I think is amazing and people go, man, it's, it's just a camera, it's just a building, it's just a watch. I'm like, do you not see what this guy did here? It's, it's wild or it's amazing, whatever. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating. But sometimes if, if you have like an amazing, you know, if, if maybe you don't know anything about cars, but you, you see a, 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 an old Ferrari from, from the 60s, it's, it's going to be difficult that uh, no, nobody appreciates it. You know? so, right. so I think the very, very, very good design or, or it's going to be appreciated by, by everyone. But of course, every, uh, you know, people have different tastes or people are onto more, you know, contemporary things or digital things or so, um, but it's, it's great that, you know, th th there is always uh, a bunch of guys who, who are going, to, who are going to, to enjoy seeing something and, and uh, yeah. So, we kind of started with your, your origin story as a brand owner. So you started buying watches, getting into watches, find, found your way onto the forum. And then I guess eventually you felt like I want to, I want to do this as a, a way to express myself outside of architecture. And I feel like I have something to say to add to the discussion of the design of watches. Do I, do I have that about right? It's it's, uh, it's not exactly that, like that because um, I uh, like four or five, four, four years ago, I had not, a, no, no, I, I didn't have an idea I, I was going to, to launch a brand. I just did, did this course, design course, because I just, you know, I, I said in Switzerland, you have a design, a watch design course. This is not something you are going to find in, in any other place. So I just. I've never heard of that anywhere else. Yeah, exactly. So I had this opportunity, I did it. And so, wait, this was in you were you were learning French. So as you were learning French, in that same school, there was a watch design course that you yeah, could yeah. take. So you just like kind of wandered in there. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, so when I ended up the the course, I, I just said to myself, okay, I, I love it. I'm going to try to to do some stuff, uh, and I just began playing my you know with with my designs and everything. But at that time, like. Four four years ago, I, I I didn't even participate in the forums. I, in fact, it was um, Eric from EMG uh, Watches that sure. invited me to, to to micro brand to the micro brand Facebook group. And um, and at that time, when when I joined the the, the, the Facebook group, uh, I was already launching my my campaign. So I I, I was not very active on on the groups and, and the forums. Um, uh, it, it all started a, a, a bit later, so right. um, it, it was not that like I, I see a, a lot of people that participate in the forums and then after two three years they say okay I'm going to launch my brand. Uh, it was a bit uh, different. I, I just launched it. I had no idea of a lot of things, <laughs> and uh, I think I was a bit lucky with the first one because uh, how I see things now and. You know, the things that, that I learned with you, with uh, Kyle, mainly. Um, uh, you know, uh, I just launched it and it worked. Uh, but then uh, I'm, I'm just learning so much now. Uh, I think I was a bit uh, kamikaze. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the, uh, the, the watch design course, but it does, it does interest me. Was this a small class, a small group of people? And... Did most of them go on to work in the industry, or were they also? Or did any of them also start brands? It was a, a very small group, like six people, and there was a guy who who worked in 
and Patek Philippe uh, as, um, as um, doing uh, painting dials, uh, another that working in uh, Bacheron Constantin doing the, the movements. And we all were uh, there because of, uh, out of curiosity, it was a very introductory uh, course. Um, it was like, uh, like a, a year. Um, mostly we, we learned how to use Illustrator and uh, oh, that would be uh, good for me. <laughs> I don't I don't know how to use any illustration software at all. I've tried to teach myself and I've looked into online courses and I just I, I can't get it. So I, I basically had to hire a designer to help me do yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Because I, I can I can imagine what I want and I'm not really good uh, with drawing, but I can sort of get through with very basic computer programs, I can sketch things out, but I, I, I've done much better since hiring a graphic designer to come on board and also a 3D designer. So they taught you Adobe Illustrator to do illustration, but were they teaching you like the aesthetics of watch design or more about structural design? Like, you know, you have to understand what goes into case engineering and, and you know, yeah. maybe even like market trends. What, what was the content of the course like? It, in fact, it, it was, um... It was, it was not a super uh, structured course, but uh, I, I was very curious and I asked a lot of questions and especially because since I'm, I'm an architect, I already had like the notion of how things, you know, you put together everything. So, but uh, you know, all the, all the questions that you, you need to ask, like uh, width of sapphire crystals, how, how do you do this or how do you screw down that right. or the movement and where, you know, all, all the things, it was great because of that. And then, uh, you know, I, I've been always very curious about, uh, um, uh, about, you know, brands and, and the, and the uh, watch and, and all the models that, that are currently selling or in the past as well. So I did, I think I did, uh, I uh, I um, I studied by my own like a bit of uh, watch history. I think it's super important. Uh, right, uh, I agree. Because yeah, I, agree. I think today there's a lot of people that you know they they see a, a watch. Maybe I don't know. Uh, they they just want to copy a style. Um, but it, it's it's good to to you know to to ha to do a bit of follow up of the history of watch making. Where uh, where things are coming and so so it, it was a bit of uh, it was a great course uh, but uh, you know for for grown ups so, so you need to 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 uh, help yourself together no they, they are not going to give you all the all the or, or or telling you what what style are you going to to design it's it's more like okay here are the tools uh, we are going to do a couple of exercises. Uh, I remember we did a, a, a free, uh, you know, a free theme uh, watch, and then another one for, was an aviation watch, and I, 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 it was great. I really enjoyed that, and, and that was it. And then, uh, and then it's everything like search on Google and you know asking right. um, everyone. So I want to get into what you've been doing recently and where where you're going with your brand. So you did the type 250 F good design, but not um, extremely distinctive as compared to where watch design kind of is today. Recently you, you, and this you showed me before you showed the world, the DRZ02, which is your most recent production is a complete departure, not just from the type 250, your first watch, but I think it's it's a very innovative design as compared to where watch design is today. And also just, in, in, like you said, in terms of where the history of watch design has been. So especially when you look at it in the context of your inspiration coming from mid 20th century design, this looks like a spaceship compared to the the type 250 so can you talk about how did you wh what were your inspirations for the the o2 and 
you know, what were some of the challenges you had? You know, obviously you just went through a design course, the DO2, the first thing that jumped out at me when you showed it to me was, you know, that bowl shaped dial and the sandwich, uh, this, it was a sandwich dial that was also bowl shaped. And I thought that I had never seen that. I wasn't even sure if that could be done. So do you want to talk about things like that? What were the challenges inherent in first figuring out how to make that watch look the way you wanted it and then get it to be, to be made that way? Yes. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting story. No, I, uh, when I, uh, when I um, uh, finished the, the campaign of the Type 250F, um, well, I, I think uh, it was my first watch. I, I had my own limitations, and but at the end, I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to create something like super unique. Um, oh, it's unique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say it's like unique or uh, super innovative but i think there are some some details or i think the the risk of how i put everything together was was the, the what, what i'm really proud of, about that that watch but the thing is that uh when i when i started designing that watch I, I i said to myself that i wanted something like super unique and something that would help me place the the brand uh differently uh you know not trying not to, to do only a, a nice watch and, uh, and, and uh, that's it like like the first one is, is, is a nice watch but uh, it's yes as, as you say it's an elegant watch but th there's nothing uh, you know something that you can uh you know it's something that it's been on the market yet so so i started designing the the, the o2 with, with this in mind uh, i wanted to to create a, a very unique dial layout but as well the, the case i think uh, sometimes the the cases is case watch cases they are a bit you know like flat or flat in the sense of you know two sided top back and that's it so so uh, boxy very boxy yeah, yeah very boxy or you know like uh, it it hasn't changed uh, since the twenties, or you know, since the first military wristwatches. The case design is exactly the same. You know, like you know, locks and uh, of course that uh, there have been you know people uh, producing uh, like crazy stuff. But I wanted to to do so something different. So um, so I think the the if if I have to say like what's the most innovative thing in the watch is, is the elliptical shape. I think that's something that it's, it's really uh, new. In, in the case, the elliptical the shape case, of the case. The, case. Yeah. the bowl shapes, uh, I think I've, I've seen those and of course sandwich uh, uh, dials. But I don't, I don't, I've never, I can't remember ever seeing a dial pattern with markers like yours. So, yes. Everybody understands numerical markers, all 12, or big pilot, 36912, or, you know, all non-numerical indices, or, you know, different dial patterns are sort of set in our lexicon, our, our design language, and we all kind of recognize them. You basically invented your own language with this design. And again, I mean, it, it, it reminds some people of... Uh, crop circles like alien crop circles it does have a very futuristic sort of sci-fi feel to it um how did you i can't even imagine trying to invent a dial pattern that would be completely unique and innovative and new and yet still be very functional and recognizable in something that is meant for a very specific purpose where recognizability and readability at a glance is, is a value for the end user. So did you, were there a lot of different alternative design choices that you discarded along the way? Or did you have this in your head at some point? Is this a pattern that <clears throat> You've you've had elsewhere in your work, or you've you it means something to you. Where where does this dial pattern come from? In fact, the, the dial pattern comes from a sector dial, and uh, 
just I just cut uh, you know the um, I added the, the circles on three uh, six and, and nine and then made this continuation of, of the of the arcs and uh, cut it on, on 12 and, and 6 but the, the base of the dial is a, is a sector dial. Um, so the basic design the basic pattern is what they call a sector dial yeah but yeah. you almost made it the, the top layer is almost like um like a, like a negative relief with the bottom layer showing through so i mean that's very innovative i can't ever remember seeing First off, it doesn't even strike me as being a sector dial, so the inspiration is not necessarily obvious. Yeah, it is. I well, I, I, I've never seen a sector dial. That the, the, the design process was super, super crazy, super intense. Uh, I did like so many variations, you wouldn't believe. I, in fact, I, I started designing that watch in September, um, in, sep um, in September uh, two, two years ago, yes. And, uh, and then after two weeks, I, I had it done. And I said to myself, well, it was too easy. And then I, I started to do variations. And, and I spent like four or five months doing variations. And of course, the, the result was completely different to, to that watch that I, that I designed to, after two weeks. Um, and at the end, I, I was thinking I was going crazy because of that. I, uh, I did so many, so many uh, tests and and then once I, I, I got the design, I, I started to change and, and the, you know, the diameter like 0 0.02 millimeters here and, and there. So, so it, was, it was very difficult to put together the, the shape, the dial shape, uh, the, the position of all the elements, the calendar, you know, and uh, it was, it, it was a, a hard job. Uh, but at the end, when, when you start like uh, moving things, so, 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 with, with such a small uh, de degree of, of uh, you know, in such a perfectionist way, then everything starts to pull together and, and, uh, and take a bit of um, proportions. So, so I, I didn't have a, a predefined idea of what I was going to do. And that's, I, I think in, in when as a designer that that's the best part when when uh, you know when you have something in your mind and you do it that's a bit you know you you're working with your you, you, you know what you're doing and that's it so 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 it's not something that is going to be original or new or interesting uh, but uh, if you start like experimenting that, that's going to take you to, to you know to an, a deep, completely different place that you, you didn't think about it, and that's what happened with the O2. So it's taken me and my team of designers a long time, a lot of iterations, to get to the point where the last few iterations we've done, I don't look back and, and, and think to myself, I wish I would have done this differently or that differently. We're at the point now where we're very happy with what we've produced, and I don't have any regrets about this or that or the date window here or the numbers there. When you look at the DRZ02, now, two years since you started, are you perfectly happy with it? Or do you look at it and go, I might do this differently, I might do that differently next time, or you know, there's something that I wish I could go back and redo? Yes, I, um, the dial, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. The case, uh, you know, uh, there are things that I, I might be, in, uh, I, I, maybe I should change a, a couple of details. And in fact, I'm, I'm designing right now the, the O4 that is going to take some of, the, some of the line of the O2, but with these small refinements that I think that, you know, I, I always say publicly that the, the O2 was, was designed like a bit like a little sculpture. So, it's true. You told me when when we were discussing this uh, two years ago that you know it's a bit flat, uh, or maybe it's not super ergonomic. Uh, I designed it more for uh, for 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 people with uh, big wrists. Um, yeah, because the that. case the case is very it's elliptical, but it's a flat shaped case as opposed to a lot of cases that kind of hug the wrist and. 
it's not it's a it's not a, a huge case, but because it's long and flat, it, you do need a kind of a bigger wrist to pull it off. Yes, exactly. So I uh, I use it with my with my uh, seven and a half uh, wrist, and it works great. Uh, yeah. But but uh, you know there there are some details that I think I could have done a bit different. So so yeah, I, I think. It, it, it was, it, it, it's more like a very conceptual design. And, um, very conceptual. Sometimes, sometimes you know, if, if you want to produce something like a bit more radical, you, you don't do your, your typical logs that, you know. Yeah, I think you, like, you had, you, I think as a designer, you took a lot of risks there, which is why I was so interested in it when you showed me, showed it to me because yeah, on the one hand, I saw some things that I thought the guys online that are into watches and will dissect and criticize a design, this is what they're going to zoom in on. They're going to zoom in on the flat case shape. But I think you realized that and you and you were willing to take that chance anyway and be bold and, and, and kind of go all in on the design. I think it's even with that criticism, it's an amazing design. It's a, it's a masterpiece and it's a really, it's a, for, for somebody just designing their second watch ever, it's really a statement piece for you and your brand that puts you on the map as someone who is definitely, I think, among the thought leaders in our business today when it comes to design. And, you know, whenever people criticize micro brands, as saying, you know, we're all just doing derivative things. We're all doing homages. I, I look at what the big brands are, are doing, and most of them are just kind of constantly rehashing their old catalogs. Micro brands are typically the ones that are taking more chances with design. And here's a great example to show people of what micro brands are doing that there's no big brand on the planet that would ever approve something like this for production. And, and this is just a wonderful thing to, that you give to the world to say, it's not for everyone, but for the people that buy it, they're going to love it because it is sort of like such an artistic, unique piece. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm very uh, happy yes. with, for you that it, that it worked out as well. As, I mean, you did very well on Kickstarter. You sold over 200 and you had 242 backers. And I guess probably some of them bought more than one. So I'm just guessing you probably sold, what, 250 through Kickstarter? Yes, uh, around 260. And and then uh, some went to, to the micro brand store in, in Japan. And, How many uh, did you make total of the DO2, the DR? 400. 400? 400. Yes. All right, and are, do you still have some available? I still have some, some in stock, yeah. Uh, Ooh, okay. Some are going to sold out because I, you know, I, I did so many models, so I have like three blacks with dates, two greens with, so, uh, there are some others that I have only one or two left, right. but in total I have, I have enough. Um, but uh, yes, exactly. It was a bit of a statement to, to do that watch. I think we, uh, as microbrand uh, owners, we, we don't have the, we can't use like fancy movements or, or the latest technology or, or doing like, you know, producing like 20 prototypes and then choosing, you know, if this angle is, so, uh, so we, we really uh, have uh, our, everything resumes in, uh, in design, um, basic, basic, uh, like uh, basic design. And, and it's the only way that we can use to, to, to express, you know, we can use, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, you, you can add a fancy rotor, uh, got it, but that's going to increase the price so much. And, um, you know, and is it worth it? Are people that see it going to understand that the price is higher because you decorated the rotor or you did something else or this machine has to be, or the, the, the case has to be, it's an intricate design, so the case has to be CNC machine versus cold forged, and that raises the price. But so many customers just look at what movement does it have? Is the crystal sapphire? How much water resistance does it have? And that, that's, what, that's what they think the price is. And they don't really ever stop to think that Sergio put two years into this design and it's such a unique design. How do you put a price tag on that? 
Um, yeah, that, that's something that it's re it, it really amazes me, you know, because even before I, I was, you know, thinking about launching a, a brand, I never thought about in terms of, of a price product just only because what it's inside, it's, it's completely nonsense. It's like, yeah, of course, if it's a buyer cuts, uh, the price is whatever and the movement, but, you know, there, there's so many things and, and then you have to run your business and, and um, uh, so, so it, it really amazed me, you know, uh, and I, sometimes, you know, it, it really hurt your feelings, no? I, I really oh, I, I know. And, and I'm looking at it. You've got this watch, this amazing work of art, Swiss movement, S uh, Salita SW200 on a beautiful strap, hand-stitched strap. Took you two years to design it. You only made 400 pieces. You've got it selling for $700, which to me is like a, the bargain of the century. If you said $1,200, $15, $2,000, I think you would still sell them. So you basically gave this, the world this beautiful object of art. And then you said, I'm going to make it affordable for everybody. And then you got people online that go, oh, it's too expensive. I, I, I don't know how to, how to even respond when they say that. It's a beautiful watch. It's, it's worth more than you're charging. Yeah, and that's another story. And I'm, uh, I'm more of I, 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 I think I, uh, I said that once. I'm, I'm a designer. I'm not really good doing business. That's, that's for sure. Uh, I'm trying to, to, to learn that part as well. But um, I honestly uh, think you could charge more. I think if, if you launched this watch, if you launched your brand as a luxury brand, and this was your first watch, and you promoted it right and you had you know the right press coverage you got into a blog to watch an odinky you could charge two thousand dollars i mean there are companies that sell watches for two thousand dollars with the same movement inside so all those guys that go well it's got this movement and i can get that same movement and another watch for 500 600 that don't put a value in your design i i think those are not your customers the best guys are the ones that go i, I would have paid two thousand dollars for it i would have paid three thousand dollars for it because it's so unique and i love it so much yeah yeah but i need to learn all, all, all that stuff and uh, and as i said i uh, it, sometimes it hurts a bit your feelings when when you hear this kind of stuff because um i can't believe you're not sold out i can't believe you're not sold out they're gorgeous they should all be gone everybody should have one of these for this price Everybody should have one. It's gorgeous. Yes, yes, but um, it's yeah. I thought in in the Kickstarter campaign I, I was going to going to do to do a bit better. Uh, that's that's the truth. Um, I, it was it was a nightmare the, the Kickstarter campaign. In fact, because uh, I reached the, the the you know the the goal of, of the curve the, the first two days and it, then it was completely flat. That's and normal though. That's normal. Do, do you think it's normal? Oh yeah, that's the way Kickstarter projects go. I mean, the, the way, it's not just Kickstarter, it's also pre-orders. We see that with my brand. We don't even do Kickstarters anymore. Yeah. Tell people what we're doing. You know, here's a watch we're making. We're already in production. It'll be ready a month, two months, three months from now. We show it to people, show it to people, show it to people. And then the day it goes on sale, we'll sell 80%. And then, you know, from there on after, the next day will sell a few more, the next day a few more, but after that, it just, it really flattens out. And that's just, I think that's just how the market is right now because everybody's buying online. A lot of people are looking at Kickstarters and pre-orders, especially obviously for micro brands. And I think that's, we just have to get used to that as business owners, that's our new normal, that's the cycle. And if you don't sell most of the watches in the first day or two, you're going to have real problems because I think, unfortunately, too many brand owners, they spend all their time working on design. Then they put it up on Kickstarter. They don't spend any time promoting it until after they start selling it on Kickstarter and pre-order. And then they think, okay, well, now it's not selling quickly enough. I got to get out there and promote it. And it's too late by that point. You need to have all that promotion lined up before you launch. No, for the old two, I, I think I did a good promotion. There I think you did. Your results show that you did. You did very well. I think you did a great job. Yes, and uh, you know, there were 
amazing reviews, like the one from Armand. So it was it was really really good. Ar Armand the watch guy reviewed it. Armand the watch guy, yeah. Yeah, he's and a nice young guy. That. He's a great guy. Yeah, and uh, he loved so much my my watch and and. Uh, but then I, I, I thought to myself, maybe, and uh, that was something I, I wanted to ask you, maybe, you know, all these uh, video reviews, maybe they, they should be uh, like uh, running during the campaign and not one month before. Because I feel that there, was, there were people who, who signed up on my email list and then I, I sent this email, uh, like, we are live, and I think they, 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 they went to, to their promotion folders, and I don't know. What do you think? So there's a longer conversation to have here, but the shorter version is, yeah, I think you're right, that there is a certain customer that has the money right now and wants to buy it right now. And then there's the other customers, and a lot, and a lot of our customers are like this, where they don't have the money right now, but they're going to get the money for the day that you go on Kickstarter or pre-order and you need to let them know ahead of time because if you if you don't they're they're going to miss out and they're and they're going to skip it because they didn't get in at the early bird price or whatever um, but also you can't your timing has to be really good as far as if you show people something way too soon then first off you run the risk of another competitor taking some of your ideas and copying it and beating you to market. You also run the risk of somebody seeing it and then their tastes change or they forget about it or, you know, something else comes up that they want and they buy that in the meantime. Um, so the timing has to be really good. I, I think about three months to promote a new model, Kickstarter project, pre-order, whatever, you know, a new release, even if it's just available right away. Um, I certainly think there's a value to having something that people can buy right now. Um, but also I think some customers just prefer, I'd rather save up the money, have it ready when you're, when you you go and put it on sale, especially if you're going to do a Kickstarter or pre-order at a discount that I can get it for even less. Um, but if you, if you do it too far in advance, it doesn't work. And it also makes your life harder because you have to keep that, that, you know, it's like, yeah, it's like boiling pasta. You got to get the water to a boil, but you can't let it cool down then. You got to keep it boiling. So what's the right time frame? Some guys like Kyle, I've seen, Kyle has promoted some of his projects, Kyle from Stratton. I've seen him promote a project for a year. And it, it seems to work for him. I mean, he does, he's, he's been extremely successful on Kickstarter. Um, but I think about all the work that he's done leading up to those Kickstarter projects. And I sometimes wonder, could he have done all of that in three months or six months instead of taking a year? Well, I, I remember in, in, in the interview that you, you did with him, he saying uh, uh, that, he, he, that he was taking too much time to promote his watches and he was thinking about uh, shortening a bit the, that. I remember he said something that was, there was one that took longer because yeah. he had problems yeah. in prototyping or production and he kind of, he got out there too soon. <clears throat> I think it was his last campaign, it, the, the last Kickstarter campaign, the, the Legera, I think uh, that it, it did, didn't do so well compared to, to his other campaigns and, and, and he, he told something that maybe he took too, too much time pr promoting it. So, so I think, yes, something between three, four months because uh, be if, if, if it takes you three months to get everybody excited once you got them excited they want to buy it so if, yes. if, if there if, if it only takes three months if that's all it takes then that's the right time period and it's not just it's not just three months for me three months for you three months for Kyle three months for all of us it's what are you doing in that three months are you posting to the same group once a day three times a week three times a day it's not just about the length of time it's about what you're doing how good is your promotion are you telling a good story do you have good imagery are you showing illustrations of a prototype how good are your illustrations are you showing photographs do you have reviews so it you have to dial it in it might not be three months it could be two it could be one or it could be six you don't know but it's quality plus quantity plus frequency and consistency i think is sort of the right recipe i think it's it's kind of a miracle when uh when a watch or uh, uh, 
works or, or do an amazing campaign. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the watch is, is it's great, but you didn't do a great promotion. Sometimes you, you do a good promotion and the watch is so-so. But what I feel is that, uh, you know, you, you see it in, on the forums, no? Uh, for example, now, everybody seems to, to, to like the, this uh, homage uh, explorer, I think it's the explorer Rolex, no? Uh, uh, the one, you know, the one by Carlos at Borealis, the... Um... Carlos and Armida, they, they, they are Armida, oh. they, they're launching this. And it, well, and Eddie Platt from Time Factors, he has the Smiths. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, and it's a smaller... Okay. Yeah, it, it's already sold out, Armida, and I think Time Factors as well, and I'm sure Carlos is going to do great. So sometimes it's, it's what people is, is looking for, you know? Uh, well, that's... That's like, you know, sort of there's a zeitgeist in what we do, and it goes sort of in cycles where it'll be the year of the pilot watch. Everybody's making pilot watches, and then it'll be the year of, you know, everybody's making a very thin, yeah, everybody's making a very thin vintage-inspired diver all of a sudden, and then it'll be everybody's looming the crowns. Everybody is doing um, racing chronographs, I, and, and, and I've seen this where all of a sudden, one guy will do something on Kickstarter and it works really well. And then three or four guys will do it within six months. Um, and I think it's just, maybe some of it is, is uh, driven by just, you know, a fashion cycle. Some of it's driven out of Switzerland, you know, the bigger brands, this is what they're doing and it gives us ideas and we kind of play off of that. I think some of us, some of it is us inspiring each other. I know I, I was talking with Chip yesterday he, he, I think, is a fantastic designer, and he's been such an inspiration for me with his work because I think he, like, like you, I mean, he's, a, he's got a, a great eye for detail. He's got natural talent. He's a natural designer. He's really into photography. But he sees things in our everyday world that nobody, most people don't see. He can look down a street and see a picture in his mind that he wants to take, and he gets his camera out. And I'm just looking for a place to eat, you know, like that's, that's the difference between us. But it's, you know, when, when, when somebody does something amazing, I think, or, or, or when something works out amazingly well, even if what they did isn't amazing, it's, it's the way it worked. Then I think we all kind of see that and go, aha, I could do that or I could do it better or I could do that and put my own little spin on it. Um, so let, let's talk about what you're doing next. So, do, do, what's, do you have a name for the new design, which is going to, I don't want to, am I allowed to talk about what the new design looks like? Yes, of course, of course. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm waiting the, the, the prototypes. Uh, they should be here uh, very, very soon. Um, is, it know, the, um, is it called the O3? The, is the DRC, uh, C the, uh, how do you say in English? DR, when you say Z, you say Z? The C, yeah. Z, O3, D3. It's, it's the D3, three, C, O3? Yeah, O3, yeah. And, um, All right, so hold on. So it's, you did the O2, and you already told us that you're working on, I think, the O4, and they have some similarities. So this, I can see in the O3, this is now your brand design language. The forms are familiar. Can we talk about what sort of watch it is, like its functional purpose? Yes. So it's going to be a, a diver watch, um, um, inspired with the, you know, all the 60s cues, uh, especially the, the Seamaster 300 and, and the, maybe the uh, Jäger Le Coultre. See, this is funny to me because I'm looking at it and I don't see Omega Seamaster here at all. I see, or 60s, I see modern, modernist, sort of post-modernist design, mm -hmm. definitely kind of Baroque. Um, I see a certain aesthetic that is a little bit familiar to me in some ways with some of the big name brands now. You know, there's very clean lines, um, geometric forms, use of color. Um, this is not an everyday, I've seen this before diving watch. This is very unique. But you're saying it's inspired by the 60s. I, I, I don't see it. Can you... How, how, do, how do you get from the 60s to this? When, when I see Inspire, it's, 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 maybe it's not copy, you know, like right. Inspire. You know, when I, when I see uh, those watches, 
uh, I want to I want to get the, the the look and feel or the elegance or the or the feeling of that era and uh, trying to um, to apply it into the, 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 the identity I'm trying to, to produce. Uh, and for example, uh, the, 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 the case uh, now it's super conventional. It's like a dive. Uh, more conventional. traditional. It's a more traditionally shaped yes. case. Yeah. Yes. Which was actually surprising to me when you showed it to me. I thought, okay, I see where you're going with the dial and the bezel and the hands. That's clearly Sergio style. But the case is, uh, you know, a beautiful case, an original case, but not crazy radical original. It's it's more traditional. Yes, uh, you know, you, you said some uh, sometime that you need to to do what you have to do and, uh, and not, not always what you love or you like. So so we have uh, to make a business. We have to we have to be able to sell what we make. <laughs> no, so so in this case. Uh, I wanted to produce something more uh, easy to wear, and uh, in, in, I was doing a diver, so I wanted to uh, to produce a case, you know, like more uh, like a standard case. Um, and what are, what are the dimensions on it? Uh, forty millimeters on, on the case and uh, forty point uh, five on the vessel. So the vessel a little bit wider. Yeah, just so a forty millimeter case. Was it twenty millimeter lugs? Yes. And, yes. and 47, 48 on the lug length? Uh, 48, yes. So very, you know, I mean, that's, that's the size of the NTH subs pretty much. So that's kind of yes. the, that's the sort of most popular size, it seems, right now. 40 by 40 yes. with 20 millimeter lugs. So uh, another Swiss Salida movement inside? Yes, the, the same Salida movement. Um, I wanted to do the vessel like really thin, but uh, compared to the to the to, to the prototypes that are arriving, it's it's a bit different the design. For example, the the hours hand that um, it's more like an arrow, uh, not a triangle. Right. So the, there are some some small details that that change since uh, since the original design. Uh, but then um, are are these? Yeah. Did you find these hands? Did you find these hands? In a catalog from a handset supplier, you design your own hand. So that's something right there that I don't think people rec realize. I've gone through this with my business where early on, I started to, when we were illustrating things, we, as a designer, I wasn't yet at the point where I understood that handsets come in sort of standard sizes and handset suppliers have this huge catalog of, of designs already made if you don't pick a handset out of a catalog, then you have to <clears throat> you have to pay more to get handsets that are custom cut to your design, and it takes longer. A lot of times, that's why there's a production delay because guys like us were ordering 300 handsets, and they've got three billion handsets in their building that they want to sell. They don't really love getting custom handset orders, and it takes forever sometimes to get them done correctly and you're if you're an artist the way you are you want your design to be what you want it to be and you can't find what you want always in a, in a supplier's catalog and i and we've we've actually stopped for the most part we stopped making custom designed hands we spend more time now looking through catalogs to find a good handset that works with the design we we had to do a custom cut hand on the devil ray because the handset we chose the minute hand was, was just a little bit too long. It didn't get, it didn't look long in the design, but it, when we, they put it together, it didn't have the clearance it needed inside the case. So they had to redo those hands. But otherwise, we, we're strictly doing catalog hands. So this is a completely original handset to your design. Yes, well, in fact, to, to tell you the truth, I didn't know there was a catalog of hands before. <laughs> like, uh... Yeah, I mean, they, they, they don't like doing custom stuff with handset because yeah. it's such a small part and there's not enough money in it. For me, uh, especially for the O2, the, the hands are exactly, you know, the, the minute hand um, places exactly on the, on the shape of the indices. Right, so, so that's something that's really difficult to do. It's yeah, difficult it's, when you draw a dial and then you gotta go find hands and you want the, the hand, the end of the hand to perfectly line up with something on the dial 
and you can't find that hand the right length. The only way you get that all the time is either changing the dial to match the hands, which we do sometimes, or you have to do custom cut hands. Yes. yes. But you're, I mean, I can tell when I look at your design, the DO2 and even now the DO3, I see, like this goes back to the conversation about you love a camera and people that don't love cameras don't see what you see. When I look at your design, I go, I see what he's doing here. He's matching all of these different elements up. So the handset matches up with the dial perfectly when they look, when they overlay. P people that don't notice it won't get it, but I see it and I really appreciate it. Yes, I think uh, that, that's, I, you know, for me, super important. I, sometimes I see uh, like, you know, every day somebody's launching a, a, a new watch and, and you see some, you know, that they don't take, this this kind of detail you know uh, in, in, into care no or, or maybe they use like a, a the other day I saw watch the the it was written 50 ATM with a Times New Roman typography no it's like okay and so so I I, I see the thing they they're trying to do a, a, a diver because they know that that's going to sell but uh, they, they leave apart so many details that for me is like the base of or, or the fun part of it, you know, like for me, the I, fun I don't, part of it. I, I, don't, I don't let myself criticize other people's typography because my first brand, Lou and Huey, I chose brush script font for my logo. And I, I no, nobody would ever let me forget that. And if I went online and criticized somebody else's typography, I, I chose the world's worst font for my logo on my original brand. And I mean, I caught hell for it. So I'm not, I don't let my, I, I don't criticize typography. Maybe, you know, I'll look at it and I'll go, not, not the best choice, but I don't say, <laughs> I don't say anything. Yeah. So, the, so, the, so the old three, for example, the, 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 uh, the, the old three, the, the idea was to, con to, to, to have some continuation of the old two in, in the general idea, but of course, applying this to, to a diver. So you have the same scheme of, of triangle and, and three dots. And, um, and the, um, you know, the, the, the idea or, or the, the idea of the watch is, 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 is uh, to show this eclipse effect. And uh, in fact, that's, uh, why, yeah. that's why, why I'm not showing 3Ds right now because I, I uh, like the O2, I need to see the prototypes to see if the effect is, is, is really what I thought or, or not because uh, if, if not, maybe I had to remove the eclipse war. <laughs> no, I know, we, we've, we've been there. We've gone through that where you design something and then you send it to be prototyped. And before you get the prototypes back and the factory says, oh yeah, we'll do it just the way you draw it. You start showing people the design and then you get the prototypes and the factory goes, oh yeah, they're a little bit different. We couldn't do this, we couldn't do that. And you're like, I've been showing people this design for three months. You, you can't just change things on me. And some of it they just change because what you want to, them to do is too hard and they just go, well, you didn't want it that way. We're helping you. You're not helping me. So um, in this case, the, 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 die, the, the center is matte and, and the, the exterior is, is some burst, a uh, few may. And because it's so small and, and you have to have this, this degrade, this fume effect be, between the center and the exterior, it's, uh, I, I don't know if, you, if, if they're going to do it uh, right, so. so. I, think they'll, I think they could do it. I mean, if you have a good, if, if they could make your first, or the, DO, the O2 dial, if, if you're using the same dial supplier, I think you'll be okay. I'm looking at it. They did such a nice job with the O2. I'm sure they'll get the, um, the O3 right. But I see what you mean. So some of the things that you're talking about are the impression it gives is of an eclipse, like a solar eclipse or a lunar eclipse. I see that definitely. I also see that theme kind of carried over in how the second, the loom patch on the seconds hand passes over the date window that you've done, which is again, a, a very nice touch, which you can only do if you find the right seconds hand or you have a seconds hand made or you change the dial to match the seconds hand you found. Um, <clears throat> I, I see that in the handset. And again, I, I do see the familiar forms that you use from the DR02, DRZ02 in the DRZ03. But yet at the same time, it still is very recognizable as a diver. And 
I think, very functional as a diver. It looks like it's got great loom. Um, it's very legible. And it is, again, I think, a very beautiful design that I think people are really going to like. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, the hard part there was, uh, I, I'm repeating the, the, the bowl shape of the dial. But since this time I have uh, applied indices, uh, uh, it, was very it was very difficult to, you know, to uh, place the, the, the just on the end. Of right, because your, your indice is flat and then your, 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 your dial is bowl shaped. Yes, and then you have the, the calendar. So I wanted the biggest um, indices as possible, but it, it couldn't be too big because of, you know. So well, if you, make was, them, if you make them bigger, then you have to change the shape of the dial so it flattens out more quickly, or you got to move the, the, the indices inward, and that throws off the balance of the design. Yes. So everything, the, the complication there, it was, it, it was more, more of a subtle design in, in terms of, uh, it was much, much easier to, to do it than the O2, you know. Um, but um, I think it's, it's something that I, uh, I, I would wear uh, with a joy. So, well, so I, think, I think it's very clear that it's an original design, but when we were talking about it, I, I see influences of vintage Bregway. Um, I see a little bit of, you know, sort of modernist kind of Bell and Ross in it. Um, I, I see it, it's, there's little things I see in it that I think, okay, that, that again, like, like the 01, there are some things about it that are familiar in their form, but all, it all comes together to be very original. But I think people that <clears throat> maybe didn't buy the O2 because it was too unique and they didn't know if they would wear it enough because maybe it's not as versatile because it is kind of like a novelty watch. This is going to be, I think, traditional enough that those people who liked the O2 as a design but didn't buy it, I think this will actually bring more of those people back to you and, and they'll buy this instead. Yes, exactly. I, I, I have to admit, uh, be completely honest, that I'm, I'm looking for a broader audience, uh, something a bit more traditional. And something that, you know, the, the, I, I'm always in, uh, in contact with, with uh, the, the, the people who, who buy my, my watches and, and I want them to have another, a different watch and the, uh, and the O2, that's why, you know, a, a lot of people told me, okay, are, are you going to repeat the, the, the digital case or, and, uh, and in fact, uh, that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, working for the O4, no? Uh, the, the idea is that, you know, you can have the, 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 the O2 and then the O3 and they are completely different. We do, we, yes. we think about that a lot too. So I've had, discussions, arguments with, you know, other brand owners. I mean, friends of mine, like Sue Jane from Melbourne and I have talked about this, where you build your business when you start, you have to come out with a few different models and then you have to choose. Or maybe at some point you have to make a choice. Am I going to go back and make more of something that I've already made because it's sold out and there's still people out there that want it? Or am I going to invest my time and energy and money into making something completely different, constantly doing new model development? Um, Sue Jane and other brand owners are, are very often of the school of thought that it, when you're a mature brand, you always have sort of a, a stable product line that doesn't change very much. Like you always have that one model or, th or two or three models that you always have them. And yeah. I, for the most part, have been sort of the opposite where I and, I, and I think others are like me, where I think about, well, if I already made this watch, somebody who already bought the watch, if they still have it, they're not going to buy another one from me. And of course, we want to constantly bring in new customers. And so there, there may be a new customer who wants something that you already made and don't have anymore. So you have to make that again for that new customer but also maybe that new customer didn't buy your first watch or second watch because they didn't like it. And you're only going to get that customer if you make something new. Plus when you make something new, the guy that bought your last watch might also buy your second watch. So you have to always bring in new customers and you have to think about 
your product mix and how it, how it affects the perception of your brand by people looking at it. But also, I don't think you can ever stop designing and making new models. That's kind of the business that we're in. We always have to be delivering something to the market that is new and fresh because otherwise I think you just kind of lose momentum and people go, well, I've already seen your, your I've seen that design 15 times now. What's new? What do you, what else are you going to show me? What else do you have to show me? And I think as yeah, designers, if we're driven, by, if we're driven by a passion to create, that never goes away. You always want to make something new and say something new with your designs, right? Yeah, that's something that I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, I, I always have the temptation of doing, trying new, new things, uh, doing something new. I think, as you say, maybe it's not the best uh, business model. Uh, for example, you have a super successful business model. You, you're always refining and uh, improving your, your, your watches, your details. Your, uh, you are always uh, doing variations of your, of your models. Uh, but there's always, you know, NTH and, and, and they are always sold out. So it's, it's an amazing model. No? Uh, so you, 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 <laughs> so you, you are like super efficient in, in all your process and you know, all your, your, um, uh, your suppliers super well. Uh, and, um, and I'm sure that you have very well studied all your numbers. I am. I, uh, as I said uh, at the beginning of the video, I I, uh, I still doing, you know, uh, I'm always having the like eighty percent of the vision is like the designer's view. So I'm trying to to deliver uh, something that I like or, or new, and, and maybe you know, uh, spending a lot of money in, in molding these handsets. And, oh yeah. Uh, and well, every time is different. So so yeah, I think my my business model is not the well, I mean, so let me, let me help you a little bit here. Um, first off, don't, don't beat yourself up. It, I, I, I didn't start my business and immediately run it very efficiently. When you start a micro brand, you know, you're not making a thousand pieces, you're making 300 pieces. And so if you just take that one example and you look at how much time and energy you put into the design and then prototyping and then the, the promotion, the Kickstarter project, the delivery, you do all of that and you only make 300 pieces. It's not very efficient. It'd be much more efficient if you could make 3000 pieces or even 600 pieces. It's twice as efficient because you only do design once. So you have to build up your brand and your business to the point where you can start to make more of a watch when you make more of a watch and you sell them quicker you get more efficiency in your business and the business gets easier to run it, it wasn't always this way for me i mean I've, I've been at this six years it took a long time and a lot of experimentation a lot of trial and error and i had to sit down at one point and really look at the numbers and like you you know talk about there's a balance between making what I want and what I think some people want versus what I know I can sell and will help the business run better and be more efficient. So there, there's a balancing act that you have to find and it's not easy to do when you're first starting out. I think you have to make some mistakes, do some experimentation, figure out what does not work so that you get closer to knowing for sure what does work. Because you know, like right now, every day almost, Guys that know me and are, are fans of my brand will say, why don't you make a GMT or a chronograph or a bronze or a titanium? And I think you would do really well with that. And I have to sort of think about that and say, or why don't you make another compressor? You know, we've made two internal bezel style cases. And I just know that, okay, we made two. People that got them really love them. I love them, but they don't sell as well. So... You know, but you can make 300 of something that doesn't really sell very well or 600 of something that sells really well. If you get your business to the point where you're making 3,000 watches a year, you can make both. You can make 300 pieces of something that you know isn't going to sell as well. And then you can also make 1,000 pieces of something that you know you can sell all day long. So that's where we're gradually getting to. But it takes a while. You can't do that in your first year. And so I tell people, I'm like, look, just give me time. 
eventually, hopefully my business grows to the point where, sure, I can do a GMT, a chronograph, a ladies watch, a small watch, a big watch, another, you know, I'll have three divers at a time maybe, but we're not there yet. I don't, I don't have a big enough business that I can rationalize doing all these things. There's certain projects, I just can't, I just can't rationalize them because I know that there won't, I won't be able to make enough of the watch and sell it quickly enough for the numbers to make sense. And the business has to keep running efficiently if I'm going to keep growing it. So it just takes time to get there. So don't beat yourself up. You're, you're right where you need to be with your business. In fact, I think you're, you're doing better than a lot of it. You're doing better than I was with my second model. I know you are. You, you've done phenomenally well. You did better on your second model than I did. So you're off to a great start. Yes, I hope so. I, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm learning. I, uh, um, I think, uh, you know, a bit, the, you know, learning from you and, 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 and Kyle, and that's why I'm launch, launching this uh, diver. I think I'm, I'm trying to, to, you know, to find this place. And, uh, and, and you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm thinking, uh, I, I think Ross uh, from Hampton said, said that as well, you know, he's, he's he does, he launched a, a watch that's going to sell a lot and then he, he has another model that he, he can have fun with it. So, so I'm, uh, I'll see, um, you know, for, for the, the, the 03, it's, it's there. I'm, I'm starting to have fun with the 04 and I'm bringing some, some, some ideas from the 02, but uh, I, uh, yeah. Uh, with, with I, 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 I know what you mean. I mean, it's, as a designer, it's, it's more fun to do something that's new and original and you get more praise from the market and the guys on Facebook and the forums when you do something that's more original and different. But my experience, and I think many guys' experience, is it doesn't sell as well. So we still have to pay the bill. So, you know, my, yeah. everybody knows my best-selling model is the NTH subs, which are, you know, a very traditional – design of you know vintage inspiration rolex tudor omega that's kind of our lexicon and people make fun of me you know to like say like oh you're just you know ripping off whoever and i say well but people love it like that that's our best-selling model why wouldn't i keep making more of that and so that that pays for things like the devil ray or you know the azores that is more yeah, I remember when, when you launched the Devil Ray, I said, wow, this, this is amazing. This, that this was our, it's, it's we so had, amazing. yeah, you it go. Was the, 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 it was, the, there was so, so many details like the Vesa with the, you know, and, um, and, and then I, I remember you saying, okay, but what sells is the subs and, uh, but I think you need a watch like the Devil Ray because yeah. guys like me, uh, and, uh, and a lot of guys, they are going to say, okay, but they, they, these, these guys, they can do this watch as well. It's absolutely amazing. It's the most beautiful diver. So uh, I think it's something that you, you, you needed to do as a, as a designer, as a brand owner. Uh, I, I, I agree. I mean, so, we, you know, we had, when, when we were working on the Devil Ray, we had a lot of fun in the design process. You know, like I've, I've got two guys, Aaron and Rusty are on my design team. So the three of us talk a lot. You know, you work by yourself. You're the only designer there. But I get to talk to these guys, and we joke back and forth. It's a lot of fun when we when we are working on something that is new and fresh, and we can inject our own ideas into it. And I feel like, as a brand, especially my brand that does make a lot of you know homages that are you know clearly inspired by something else, it's important to show every so often that we can do something original that is unique and and kind of wild a little bit, but also very solid you know from a design perspective that guys like you look at and go oh no that that's a good design like it, it aesthetically it all lines up it makes sense mathematically it adds up but yeah i mean it we didn't sell nearly as many devil rays as we did the subs i mean we're we're i think we're close to three thousand subs we've produced by this point and we only made wow. 350 of the devil ray we only made 300 of the tropics the antilles and the azores so yeah i mean you you got the, DR, the DRZ02 out of your system and you did very well with it. So I think that's great because that now has become your signature piece. And then you'll continue that with the 03, which I think the 03 will do even better than the 02 because it is more of a, 
but a continuation, but more traditional. I don't know what the 04 looks like yet. Maybe you'll show me sometime, but if you can continue to find that good balance between doing things that are fun and original and unique and get people to notice what you're doing, but maybe don't sell as well, but also doing things that are maybe more traditional, not as, as fulfilling as a designer, but are more commercially successful, that's a good business mix. And you just got to figure out how much of the one versus how much of the other, but you'll get there. Yes, yes. I, I think uh, we all are a bit impatient, but it's true. And, and just, you know, I always say that I'm, I'm the new kid on, on the blog and I've been here for uh, no more. You got people's years. attention. You're, you're the new uh, kid, but you got people, you, you're the new kid, but you've got people's attention. <laughs> so, so, yeah, no more than two years and uh, learning and uh, trying to, to catch up with everything. So, so, so yeah, I think uh, I have, um, it, it's amazing. Uh, it's, uh, when you're doing this, it's, um, it's, 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 you are your only enemy, you know, you, uh, your fears and everything is, is, you know, either you are super confident and you go there or, or, uh, you know, sometimes you, you just say, well, this is, um, but, um, uh, yeah, it's something that it's super interesting, you know, the process and, and if I always say, uh, it's, you need to be super passionate because, <laughs> uh, you think, yeah, you, you design a watch and that's it, but wow, when, that's when not it. The street, man, this is so much work. I well, every, everybody, is, everybody's passionate when it comes to designing the product. But you also have to be passionate about promoting the product and running your business effectively and efficiently. You have to be passionate about all of those things. If you're just passionate about the product, it's probably not going to work out as well for your business. So we need to wrap this up. We've been going a little bit more than an hour here. Um, tell us about the timeline for the O3. When do you think you're going to show it to the world? You're waiting on prototypes. When, when are you expecting them? Uh, I expect them to be here uh, between next week and the other one uh, at the end of the month. Okay, um, and, and then what? My, my goal was to, to, to launch uh, another Kickstarter campaign on, on uh, beginning or mid-October uh, to have this at least three months, uh, yeah, two, two months and a half to, to, to promote it. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting and, uh, and hope they, they all arrive uh, nice. Um, so if, if the prototypes arrive and they're what you want, you show them to the world. If, they're, if there's something that needs to be changed, then you delay a little bit and you change it, you re-prototype maybe or no? Yeah, well, I, I think the, the, the prototypes, they're, they're going to arrive uh, as, you know, as design. Uh, it's just, you know, like, I think there is a five or ten percent, uh, uh, you know, possibility that I see the watch and I say, you know, this is such a crap. But you know, the O2 was was I received the prototypes; they were perfect. I, I did all the pictures. Uh, when I saw them, uh, I said, oh, "Wow!" Uh, it's what you expected. The prototypes were what you expected. Uh, tap your screen. There we go. Three, so it should be all right. And, uh, and I, I'm sure that, you know, but if there's something wrong, I, I think uh, I'm going to be a, a bit out of the timeline and I, I don't know what's going to happen, but uh, hopefully they will arrive well and I'll have the, the opportunity to launch it in October. And my goal next year would be to, to launch two watches, one in, in April and another in, in October. So I'm all, already thinking about the 04 in April. Uh, but you know, we'll see because you know, as as you know, uh, when you're so so young as a brand, if if something goes wrong uh, with the with your campaign, that's it. It's the end of the brand. So so uh, at the beginning, I thought you know, I I I I, I will uh, produce a, a Kickstarter campaign. There's no risk, and then you realize that there there are so much risk because. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I I, I lost so many nights of sleep with my first project, the Ricardo was a, you know, chronograph. We were using a Chinese mechanical chronograph movement. All these people had pre-ordered and done Kickstarter. I had all their money and I had already wired 
funds, like half of the money to the factory to start it. And then after we started production, they were saying, well, there's problems with the movement. Can we use a quartz movement? Or, you know, can we do this? Can we do that? I'm like, I, you, you, can't, you can't do this to me now after you started production. We, you should have figured this out already. So, you know, and yeah, I mean, the little things like the straps were crap the, on the prototypes. I didn't know for sure that the little things I wanted to be improved for production were going to be improved. I, I, so many nights I would just lay awake in bed all night worrying that this could go horribly, horribly wrong. And I've already spent everybody's money. I can only give them back half at best. And yeah. I, I actually had my own money invested in the project. So my money was gone too. So it was, yeah, it was scary. And then people it's don't really realize. Hard. The, the, the production time, it's, it's really hard. For, for me, the O2 was really hard. You, you can't control anything. You have all this money, all these people waiting. Uh, and for something. months, for months. Yeah. And, and there are people who say, well, can we get an update? And they don't realize like, we started production two months ago. Production is four months between day one and like the end of like three and a half months in, there's no updates. They, they, they don't tell us anything. Like they, they get all of the parts in like in that last month. And then maybe they send us pictures of the cases or the dials and then they start assembly and that takes like three weeks. Like that's it. Like the first three months of a four month production cycle, there's no updates because there's nothing to tell. They're, they're making the parts. There's nothing to show anybody, yeah. you know? Yeah, you don't have any controller at all, and that's hard. You know, when when you, you you want to control everything, and and just before launching the campaign, the production part, you, you have everything on control, and, and then uh, yeah, as soon as you send uh, them the money, you lose all control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's hard. It's really hard. Well, it seems like you're handling everything very well, and I know that people are going to be very excited about the DRO three, and I'm sure that your business will continue to grow. I'm a big fan of what you're doing. So, you know, I can't wait to see the 04. When you're ready to show it to me, I'll be happy to see it. And if I can do anything to help you, by all means, do not hesitate, reach out, ask me anything. I'll be happy to help you in any way I can. I know, I know, Chris. I, uh, of course, I'll, I'll show you the, the first, as, as I did with the, with the 02. Uh, no, I, I, you know, I'm super uh, thankful with, with you, and, uh, you know, uh also kyle he always he, he he's he's, there he's right. a good guy kyle from strat yeah, is a good guy you know it's it's amazing that you and, and uh, you you can share all this experience you know it's it's super important and and uh, all, always having your feedback it's it's, it's great so so well, i i i I, just, I I don't feel so alone you know like embarking no we, i mean that was so important for me when I started my business to have friendships with guys like Sue Jane from Melbourne and Chip from AVIG. And then I met Jason from Halios and other guys that, you know, we have kind of like a fraternity and, you know, new brand owners, we, we, on the one hand, it's like, Oh God, another guy launching a micro brand. How many of us can there be? But at the same time, we want to make sure that, when a new brand starts and the owner takes people's money on Kickstarter or pre-order, we want to see those projects work out because when a project fails and people are waiting six months or the, the quality isn't there, that makes all of us look bad. Everybody goes, I'll never do another Kickstarter. Or I'll never buy from another micro brand because this is what happens. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah. we're not all the same. And I, and I really believe that if we all not cooperate in, in, you know, like in our inside of our businesses, but if we all help each other build our businesses and, and share knowledge, then we can start to affect how the industry does business because there are so many things that are broken or wrong about this business and how it runs. I, I, don't, I don't mean like our business, I mean the industry, like the factories, how they do things, the minimum order quantities, the production times, the communication, the expectations. So much of that can be fixed but it's only going to be fixed when they feel the pressure from us. And that's only going to happen when we all kind of agree to do things the way we think they need to be done to help our businesses and to help our customers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, yeah, so I don't mind, I don't mind sharing my, my knowledge with, with you guys that are, that are 
newer in your business because I feel like, okay, I'm helping my competitors, but this is going to help me and my business long term because if it if it helps improve the industry and these guys do better, that's one less guy that makes all micro brands look look bad. Yes. No, and at the end, I don't feel like a competition. You know, no. we are all producing beautiful stuff. NTH has his a very amazing identity with his amazing fans and Kyle as well. And yeah, you know, we are all trying to. And and uh, I think everybody knows that if if we are bringing you know good stuff to everyone and everyone has more you know possibilities to decide what they want, you know. Uh, it's it's you know everyone can grow their collection of watches you know in the forum guys they have 150 watches 80 watches yeah. and there are guys so, out there that just love micros and they only buy micros and you know there it's like the guy that only drinks micro brew beers and that's all they drink but they love 12 different brands or whatever I mean there are, there are lots of guys out there and I think what we do all of us as a group generally micro brands I think we're really producing some some fantastic designs some great work great quality most of us are fantastic values some of us are maybe too good a value and um yeah i mean i think it's a great time to be a watch enthusiast and a watch geek if, you, if you're if you're open to buying micro brands i mean we're, we're just doing such great things i think yeah man all right so thank you so much chris thank you my for pleasure to be here so every, a pleasure. Everybody that wants one of your watches wants to go to DirenzoWatches.com. It's D-I-R-E-N-Z-O Watches.com. That's where they can find the O2, the 250F, and where you're probably going to have some information about the O3 when you start showing that to people, hopefully within the next week or two. Yes, as soon as I get them, uh, I will make, produce some pictures and, uh, and create a, a blog and uh, I start sharing some, some information. So, so hopefully very soon and um, and i hope to meet you in person soon yeah i love that if you ever get to hong kong uh, i go pretty much every other year i'm not i went last year i'm probably not going this year but i'll probably go again next year uh that's a pity because i'm going this year oh uh, uh, well um i know steve laughlin from raven is going to be there and yeah. um and ross I think, uh, I think chip chip you went from avid i think is going i think steve laughlin from raven is going uh, I don't know about Jason Lim from Halios. He he, he's 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 he does this all the time. He says he's not going, and then he shows up. Um, I think he's hiding from me. I, I don't think he wants to see me, maybe. But uh, he he might go there. Uh, and obviously, you know, there are guys that live there. There's Hong Kong Ed. There's some other brands that are based there. And, and you know, the guys from Singapore will very often go, like El Shan from Zelo. So, yeah, I would I would I would encourage. I'm message them. Yeah. What's that? Idea. I'm going yeah. to message them. Yeah, I would definitely contact all those guys and say, are you going to be in Hong Kong? Can we get together for drinks, for dinner? Can I see you at the show? When we go, it's a great time because we all get together. We have dinner. We have drinks. We share ideas. Did you see this guy down here with this bracelet? That's a great class, but that's a great dial. We, you know, that, that's a great time to go and network with other brand owners. And also, how do you handle a situation like this with a customer? Or how do you handle a situation like this with your vendor? You're going to learn so much when you go to Hong Kong. It's just a yeah. great experience. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, it's a pity you, you are not coming this this uh, year, but I'm sure we are going to cross paths. We will. Soon. Very uh, soon we'll cross paths. And, and maybe I, I wouldn't mind getting to Switzerland. Um, Sergio Dorenzo, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. See ya. Mm -hmm.